Hello everybody, welcome to Drydock episode 44, a few bits of random channel admin and some good news. Um, random bits of channel admin is that, as per the last Drydock, the announcement of competition winners for um, last month's Battleship Design competition is a little bit delayed, um, both due to me forgetting to tell everyone to stop sending entries in by a week and also the sheer number of entries that have been received, so... It's going to take a bit of a while for me to sort through all those, so um, hopefully next week, maybe the week after, um, depending on how life treats me. So that's the admin bit. What's the good news, I hear you ask? Well, the good news is um, that one of the more popular videos on the channel is the one about USS Texas, and at the end I had, um, shall we say, a little bit of a rant about the state that the Texas had been allowed to um, fall into. The good news is that this week there has been an announcement that the Texas will be fixed. They have passed a bill for $35 million for repairs. So the ship, if they can get it out of there without it falling apart, is heading off for dry docking to be repaired and brought back up into shape. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it will not be returning to its current mooring position. Um, they haven't said where it's going to go, uh, just the upper Texas coast as a general region. I guess they're going to um, solicit uh, bids from various places, but apparently this is because they just aren't getting enough visitors at its current uh, location. I guess they're probably going to move it to a more populated area that's easier to access, um, which is in some ways a shame because where it is at the moment does provide some for some rather wonderful videos and picture opportunities um, due to the fog and the location on the riverbank and the fairly natural environment. On the other hand, the water there is the next best thing to dipping a steel ship in acid, so... Um, Practically anywhere else will probably degrade the hull less. But anyway, anyway, good news. Texas appears to be saved and will hopefully be rejigged and repaired, which is all good. Anyway, let's get on with the questions, shall we? So the videos we're taking specific questions of for the first part of the dry dock are the Coastal Defences Special with Military History Visualised and the HMS Revenge and USS Fletcher guides that uh, immediately followed it. So let's start with the coastal defences history. For sources on this one, um, well, as you might be able to tell if you watch the whole thing through, this covered several hundred years worth of coastal defence and fortification development, plus a little <laughs> segue into Jutland. So, um, yeah, listing all the sources built up over the years that I've read for this is just going to be an far too long so I'm not going to do that if you want to know specific sources on specific details of aspects of that video let me know in the comments below and I will quite happily provide them but I'm not about to sit here and list off book titles for the next 15 minutes. Alexander asks a question that quite a number of others ask in that particular video which is what about the Sevastopol and Leningrad batteries as the defences of both cities were greatly aided by their coastal fortifications? Well as Alexander suspected in the rest of his question the reason that they didn't really get much of a mention in the coastal defences video was that impressive though they were most of their actual combat usage came in shooting at the Wehrmacht rather than the Kriegsmarine, um, albeit that they did have a role in keeping various pa passages open for Soviet submarines and uh, destroyers making supply runs and such like. So they, they did have some intended use, um, but as I said, the vast majority of their use was actually weirdly acting as a kind of coastal-based land fortification rather than a defence against seaborne assault. So you can see from the map here just how important uh, coastal fortifications could be when turned into uh, defences against land-based attacks. The sort of pinkish area off to the left, that little pocket um, that's otherwise surrounded by Wehrmacht, um, was basically centred on a coastal fortification, the Kranznaya Gorka Fort Complex, um, and you can see why that was put there relative to the city itself in terms of guarding access out into the Baltic. Um, this is obviously in Leningrad. Um, but it obviously then turning its guns back around to um, face off against the Germans, plus also keeping that, that sea route open, um, 
yeah, it, well, it held out throughout the entire siege um, until the Soviets were able to relieve it. So, good on that fortification. Now, as far as the siege of Sevastopol goes, this actually kind of illustrates in some ways some of the weaknesses of coastal fortifications that I pointed out in the original video, in that the coastal defences here were pretty strong, and they did hold the Germans up, helped hold the Germans up for quite a while. Unfortunately, the Germans then just brought along the biggest artillery they could get their hands on. Um, we're talking about Karl Garat Mortar, uh, Mortar at 600mm, and then, of course, uh, the ever-wonderful Dora Cannon. Um, these things make the mere 17 and 11 inch siege mortars of the rest of the German field artillery train look rather pathetic. Um, and of course the Dora gun was notable for taking out, amongst other things, one of the main magazines for the Sevastopol ports. And um, to give you some idea of just how well built these forts were to conventional weaponry, this was a magazine that was in a bunker that was protected by quite a bit of concrete that was then under the seabed that was then under the sea. No conventional weapon short of dropping maybe the entire destroyer's worth of depth charges right on top of it was ever going to crack that. And then along came the Dora guns like, well, one big shell and that's the end of that, I guess. Um, so yeah, um, definitely don't get in the way of one of those things. Michael Sukup 1995 asks, are there any ship's cats currently on active duty in the Royal Navy or any other Commonwealth Navy? If not, who was the last one to officially retire? I'm not 100% sure regarding all Commonwealth navies, but unfortunately for us, uh, pets, including cats, were banned aboard Royal Navy warships back in the 70s, supposedly on hygienic grounds. So as far as I'm aware, uh, unless there are any um, covert pets aboard, there are no official ship's cats currently on active duty in the Royal Navy. Now, as far as the last ship's cat, I'm going to obviously hazard a guess that some ship in the Royal Navy in 1975 had a cat, but I can't find any particular um, evidence of it. So in terms of the last animals aboard uh, Royal Navy ships that are actually sailing out in the ocean, um, well, they're, they're, I think there's a three-way tie from what I've been able to find. Um, you're either going to be looking for a hamster on HMS Eskimo that technically should have been uh, put ashore but escaped and uh, was randomly seen for about a year or so thereafter um, scurrying around the ship mostly in the laundry um, then you have Mongo the elephant yes I said that correctly the elephant he lived on HMS Courageous um, for a while it's the Royal Navy don't ask um, and then if the probably the longest serving one um, is that there are accounts on HMS Fearless, the amphibious assault ship, that there was a tortoise aboard well into the 80s. Um, he'd been painted with a luminous stripe on his back so you didn't tread on him by accident. Um, but apparently he lived uh, on HMS Fearless well after the ban on animals aboard ship generally. So there you go. Stephen I asks, would a self-propelled gun scaled to have a battleship caliber gun on it have been a good coastal defense weapon since it removes the problem of forts being non-mobile? In theory, yes, and this was done, you could technically say, with railway guns, but in terms of sort of rail-independent self-propelled weapons, well, practically speaking, if you're going to go self-propelled, the technology to move a gun of that kind of size really only comes about towards the end of the Second World War and after, at which point um, everyone's into missiles and bombs and aircraft. So, yes, in theory it would have worked, but in practice um, the technology just wasn't there to do it unless you were prepared to invest in a railway gun, uh, which is much more limited. Herbert Zinn asks, how long would it take a museum ship to be converted back to a functional warship? This largely depends on what kind of museum ship you're talking about. Um, so if we go for some of the older museum ships, for example, USS Constitution is still technically seaworthy and is afloat. So if you want to convert it up back to a functional warship, at least as far as it was at the, in uh, the 18th and 19th centuries, it would be a case of, well, put a crew on it who can, who know how to sail a tall ship, 
um, a bit of drill in how to fire old ye oldy school guns, and you're back in business. Um, similar era, so something like HMS Victory, it would take a lot longer because HMS Victory has had holes cut in the bottom for ventilation purposes. And also, last time I was there, most of the masts and rigging were down. So in Victory's case, you'd have to put all the masts and rigging back up. Um, I think most of the guns are replicas, so I don't know what you'd have to find some proper old guns. Um, then you'd also have to go and... Oh, that could be wrong. I'll find out when I go there soon. Um, uh, uh, you'd also have to obviously plug those holes in the hull and then check over the hull to see if it is actually still structurally able to withstand uh, sea journeys. Although, again, last time I was there, apparently the answer is yes, if you did plug the holes. Um, going forward to the probably what you're asking more about in terms of the modern stuff like the Missouri or any of the American battleships, it depends on what exactly the state it therein is i mean like something like texas is probably going to need years of um work before it's even able to s stay afloat let alone set sail anywhere um some other ships have had parts robbed to keep um other ships functional um the north carolina a class battleship that they've got as a museum ship i believe got rather extensively uh, pillaged to keep the Iowas running back when the Iowas were in fact still in service um, but if we look at something like an Iowa class um, some military equipment will have been taken out um, but putting that back in would probably only take three to six months I would imagine the single biggest problems you're going to have will be the functional mechanisms aboard the ship itself so the, the main turret rings um, making sure they can actually still work and the finer scale machinery down in the engine rooms um, most museum ships they don't tend to pay much attention to the engines because hey it's going to be a stationary museum ship um, the Iowa's class machinery for example is pretty much at the end of its natural lifespan and they've been sitting stationary for varying numbers of years I would be highly surprised if some of that machinery actually even worked nowadays i suspect a lot of it probably would have seized up and would be far more far too complex to try and uh unseize so the the single biggest issue of converting a museum ship back to a fully functional warship apart from the fact they're museum ships and therefore nowhere near up to date um would probably be that you'd need to replace the engines um i would imagine and so we're on to the other two videos. So sources for the Revenge class video. Uh, British Battleships, 1919 to 1939. Uh, DK Brown's ever wonderful The Grand Fleet. And the more recent uh, Norman Friedman book, Fighting the Great War at Sea. Uh, all good reads. And of course you have um, Doolin and Garski's uh, Allied Battleships. Um, as shown here and for the Fletcher class the primary um, reference material was Norman Friedman's US Destroyers Illustrated Design History. David Harris asks the unrotated projectile mountings were removed from Royal Navy ships fairly early in the war do you know if these weapons were ever used in anger and to what effect? So the answer is yes. Um, from what I can tell, the unrotated projectile launchers were used in 1939, 1940 and early 41 um, in anger however they were not seen as particularly effective they took too long to actually set up get launched and whatever aerial minefield they actually established generally was just avoided by incoming aircraft um, people seemed to forget I think when they were designing it that well when you're operating in the air you have a 3d volume to use um, it's not like on the ground where you can just put up a wall and people can't go around uh, over it they have to either go around it or or through it it's like no you can just fly above it <laughs> c fodder asks in relation to the revenge class video at three minutes two seconds you say after a variety of planning shenanigans at the admiralty come on give us a little sample of what you're referring to okay so some of the planning shenanigans that went on at the admiralty between the laying down of the queen elizabeth and the laying down of the revenges included but were not limited to a proposal to build more Queen Elizabeths, um, which scuppered, was scuppered on the grounds of uh, costs. A proposal that Canada would pay for three Queen Elizabeths or derivative designs thereof, um, also scuppered due to costs by the Canadian Parliament. 
then there was a proposal that uh, for effectively a, a slower form of Queen Elizabeth with Iron Duke style turret layout, i.e. five twin 15 inch gun turrets. Um, that was returned by the Royal Navy designers as basically saying, well, we can give you what you want, but we can't give it to you on the displacement that you've specified the ship to be. Um, there were also some muted calls for a year of battle cruisers after the Queen Elizabeths had put the nicks on the first attempt on that particular bit of shenanigans. Um, and of course, the obligatory pop in from a Vickers salesman going, but what about our 14 inch gun though? Maybe, maybe you want more ships armed with that gun. Um, yeah, Vickers desperately tried to sell that 14 inch gun to anybody who would listen, but apparently the Royal Navy never did. Um, lots of people overseas did, um, but they were forever trying to get the Royal Navy to buy the 14 inch as well. Hell Speicher, I think says how effective were the 18 inch guns on furious short answer not very effective at all um furious was designed originally to carry two single 18 inch guns one for one aft as an even more absurd development of courageous and glorious which carried a single twin 15 inch turret uh one forward and another aft um so yeah Basically, when they were outfitting Furious, they began to get the first reports back from Courageous and Glorious. And Courageous and Glorious, and by extension Furious, were so lightly built that during initial trials, um, they had suffered either hull plate or hull frame warping from the following things. Sailing at full speed, rough seas, especially strong winds, incorrectly loading the ship, medium seas when turned broadside, sharp turns, inappropriately attached tow ropes, and their own main battery shockwave when they fired. So when they were coming to finish Furious, they looked at the massive 18-inch gun and went, um, no. And so Furious ended up with only a single 18-inch gun at the back. Um, even if it had both, it would have been hopelessly inaccurate because, well, two guns is not enough for accurate salvo firing. One gun, um, just, well, eventually, put it this way, eventually they took one, uh, at least one of the 18-inch guns, stuck it on a monitor, fixed on the broadside, and said, right, that's where it's living now. It can shell stationary targets, and that's all we're ever going to use it for. Um... As far as the idea of ever using those single 18-inch guns on capital ships, it was just a non-starter, especially on Furious. It, um, albeit that it did leave Furious very briefly as the world's most heavily armed aircraft carrier when it had a flight deck on the front and a single 18-inch gun on the back. Galdir Ioni asks, Aside from your personal favourite Flag Lieutenant Seymour and the unsung genius in command of the Kamchatka, who would you say are the absolute most inept naval officers you've ever encountered in your research? So I think there's going to have to be a slight distinction here because if you've listened to any number of my videos you might think I'm immediately going to nominate Admiral Beatty and yes he was a colossal failure as commander of the battlecruiser fleet however he wasn't inept more just horribly wrong um he had his tactics and he stuck to them um they were just horrible tactics and <laughs> ended up costing a lot of people their lives which is not good um in terms of ineptness in terms of kind of when you sort of sit there and wonder why are you even in charge of these things um it's it's a difficult field. There's a surprisingly large number of inept naval officers across the across the time. Um, in the World War Two period, I would probably put um, Admiral Carita at the time of uh, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Certainly ranks up there in the fact that he apparently had no idea to distinguish between destroyers and escort carriers and fleet carriers, cruisers and battleships. Plus one of my main categories for ineptness he couldn't even stick to his own plan or come up with a new one he just sort of wandered about changing orders left right and center and eventually ended up giving up and running away at the point of victory that's pretty inept um some of the italian admirals in world war ii they did have some fairly good admirals especially towards the end of italy's involvement in the second world war but some of their earlier admirals especially the um political more political than meritocracy merit meritous in uh, appointees to those roles again 
um, one of the big flank flags for ineptness on from at least as far as I'm concerned is just constantly facilitating about what you're going to do and some of the uh, combats that the Italian fleet partook in kind of showed that in as far as it was let's all sail out and confront the British yes that's a good idea oh look the British let's all run away again um, yeah, okay that's not really helping matters um, and I'm pretty sure the Italian captains and crews really didn't appreciate it because when they were under vaguely competent leadership, albeit that some of their ships, especially their small ships, had some fairly horrendous design flaws, most Italian ships and crews still showed a reasonable uh, degree of willingness to get stuck into a fight when they weren't being dragged all over the place by an admiral who changed his mind every five minutes. And then ranging slightly further afield, I'd say you have Admiral Alexeyev, who was in charge of the defence of the Russian Far Eastern Pacific possessions, in the run-up to the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, who completely failed to prepare for the eventuality of Japanese attack, and then basically wouldn't let his actual naval commander attack. Um, so yeah, it's like you, you won't prepare for your own defence, but you also won't let your naval forces attack. He basically took the single most powerful formation of Russian warships available and threw it away. And then finally, I'd have to put Admiral Villeneuve, commander of the Combined Fleet in 1805, on the pedestal, since his objective was to either secure the channel or get the British away from the channel, which, considering he had a much larger fleet, shouldn't have been too difficult to do with a half-decent amount of training, and instead all he managed to do was sail across the Atlantic and back again, um, being chased by the British the entire time, and failed to keep up even a basic modicum of training so that even though he would pretty much guess what Nelson's plan was when Nelson actually started to enact said plan, his fleet was so poorly trained they kind of just sat there and watched it happen rather than taking any countermeasures. So yeah, inept admirals, there you go. The True Gamer's Dynamite asks, do you know which Fletchers had 14 40mm guns? I wonder if there are any photos. Well, there were 51 of them so that were refitted to that standard, so it would take quite a while to name them all. Um, but USS Bennett and USS Caps were two of them, and as you can see in the photo above, here is USS Caps in that configuration. So to help you locate them, you've got a pair of 40mm uh, either side of the bridge, between the bridge and the second 5-inch uh, gun turret, you can see that on the right. On the stern view in the middle, you can see there's a twin 20, a twin 40 millimeter gun between uh, the third and fourth turrets, and then on the left there, you can see there are a pair of quad 40 millimeters in place of the forward torpedo tubes. And as you can now see here, here's a closer up view showing that quad torpedo tube replacement with many many lovely 40 millimeter Bofors guns. Green Bean asks, we know that Yamato had an anti-aircraft shell for its main guns, and I believe the US Navy tried out atomic shells for its battleships. Do you know of any other interesting or weird shells countries tried to develop for their ships far from 1900 onwards? So I've covered this partially in other Dry Dock episodes, so I'm going to briefly just cover a couple of the more interesting ones. Um, one of which, the CPC, or Common Pointed Shell, used by the Royal Navy, um, up to sort of World War One-ish period, short and shortly thereafter, the CPC shell was basically a halfway house between an armor-piercing shell and a high-explosive shell, and it relied on the era of distributed armor, i.e., not all-or-nothing armor. Um, and so this shell had a, as you can see by the pictures above, a very, very large bursting charge compared to an armor-piercing shell. Um, but it wasn't just very thin-walled contact point explosive like a high-explosive shell. It did have a, a small armor-piercing cap, and the idea was that this kind of shell at battleship calibers could punch through the thinner armor plates of that were common across many battleships of the period and obviously cruisers and stuff as well um, and then deliver an absolutely monstrous near high explosive level no, near high explosive shell level of charge deep into the enemy ship which would be absolutely catastrophic that went away with the advent of the all or nothing armor scheme and uh, it was just like okay we'll just use ap from now on um the other rather interesting naval shell 
of the period would probably be the gas shell. Um, this was investigated in between the wars, um, and there people quite worried about it. There were a lot of gas proofing measures that gas must issued to naval ships in the run up to World War II. Um, but as it turns out, they're not particularly effective because ships are always moving. So if you fire a gas shell, the ship just sails out of the gas cloud before it has much of a chance to do anything. And finally, before we move on to the next section, Wing Hung Yun asks, is there any way the German high seas fleet could have invaded the USA as Kaiser Wilhelm wanted Dash Plan to do in the early 1900s? So just briefly, for those of you who aren't in the loop, what was the plan? Well, after it was pointed out to Kaiser Wilhelm II that no, the high seas fleet could not in fact attack the entire American East Coast and blockade it, um, he came up with an alternative plan, and this alternative plan involved suddenly loading 100,000 of Germany's finest troops with 75,000 tons of supplies and a whole battery of artillery, loading these all onto a bunch of ships, sending them with the entire high seas fleet, showing up off New York Harbour, landing the troops nearby, laying siege to New York Harbour while the high seas fleet flattened the fortifications and any ships that happened to be caught in the vicinity, taking it over and then theoretically winning a war? Yeah, no one was exactly impressed with this concept, so as far as the question goes, could the Germans have pulled this off? Well, given that it would have taken them just under a month to cross the Atlantic, the US Army in the latter part of the 1900s and the early 1910s basically just really wasn't much of anything. And the Germans had a big enough army that in theory they could actually probably pull this off fairly quickly quickly and surprisingly and at that point the high seas fleet probably does act, well does have the numbers to batter aside any uh, reaction force the US Navy can scramble yes in theory assuming that Britain and France and everyone else who really doesn't like the German Navy sits back and watches it happen it's theoretically possible for the Germans to land their troops on American soil and start shooting up New York Maybe New York would surrender rather than be blown to pieces. Maybe not, who knows. To be honest, it's less of a pride issue, more of a practical issue, because there's not really any way to defend New York against that kind of sudden assault. Um, quite what would happen after that, however, is another matter entirely, because it's like, yes, well done, you you have achieved this thing, now how are you going to defend it, how are you going to supply yourself, how are you going to supply the high seas fleet? Um, yeah, none of these questions were answered, and that's why the German general staff who saw this plan thought it would never actually work. So, to the short answer to your question, yes, technically they could invade the USA in terms of landing troops, no, that wouldn't actually do them any good. Um, it's a very expensive way to lose 100,000 of your finest troops and a bunch of artillery. So, as it is the first dry dock of the month, that means it's now Patreon question time. So, Robert Henry Ilston asks, instead of upping the diameter of a main gun, how often do naval ships, naval dash ship architects, increase the calibre length instead? And to improve performance, can you give any examples of pros and cons? It's not often done because, generally speaking, people want the extra hitting power, um, but there are a few examples where this occurs, or occurred. Um, so, in the latter half of what you could argue is the first stage of the Dreadnoughts, um, so you've got first generation Dreadnoughts, second generation Dreadnoughts, and then you step up to Super Dreadnoughts. During the second generation Dreadnought period, quite a few people, including the Royal Navy, experimented with making longer, sort of 50 caliber and thereabouts, 12 inch guns, as opposed to the uh, low, for low to mid 40 calibers that 12 inch guns had been up to that point. Um, some worked, some didn't. The Royal Navy's 12-inch 50 caliber gun was one of the ones that really didn't work that well. Um, and that was part of the uh, major impetus towards the British developing the 13.5-inch gun. So that's one era. Um, another era you could look at is actually the interwar period. Um, the Germans obviously rounding off World War One with the 15-inch guns on Baden and Bayern. And then obviously going for 15 inch guns after a short interlude of 11 inch, but going for 15 inch on the Bismarck and Tirpitz. So their main caliber didn't actually increase, but their um, 
the uh, actual length of the barrels definitely did. The Italians you can make a certain degree of argument for, although they're surviving World War One battleships were smaller caliber. The Francisco Caracolios, um, which were their design for a 15-inch gun battleship at the end of World War One, were fairly well advanced. So going with 15-inch on the Latorios, albeit with obviously uh, longer barrel, uh, higher velocity weapons, could be argued to be an example of that. And then, of course, you have the Colorado to South Dakota dash Lexington uh, design iteration where they went for 16 inch 50 caliber over the shorter barrel on the Colorados and where they basically repeated the exercise again uh, with the South Dakota 1930s designs when they switched up to the Iowa and Montana class battleships. So yeah those those are the uh, examples where they upped the gun barrel length as opposed to uh, the caliber pros and cons well basically the the pro is that you don't have to increase the turret or barbette diameter because the dimensions of the gun width wise should in theory be roughly the same um, which makes it easier to replicate ships um, uh, sort of commonality of parts etc um, other pro is obviously higher velocity on the shells which means greater horizontal penetration um, the cons are generally t tend to work around two things. One is that obviously high velocity naval gun means that the shell trajectory is flat, which is good for horizontal penetration, but it's also simultaneously bad for deck penetration um, if you're trying to shoot at uh, long distances. The US tried to solve some of this issue with a super heavy caliber shell in the 16 inch 50 in the Iowa. Um, but the other con is also just material science. Quite a few nations, especially in the World War One period, and this was a major failing of the British 12-inch 50, was that their material science wasn't quite advanced enough to support a major gun barrel, that a major caliber gun barrel that was that long. Um, so you ended in, tended to have a lot of drooping um, or whipping and other things that basically impeded on the gun's accuracy. To a certain extent, you really only see successful 50 caliber and beyond guns when you get up to into the region of 15 and 16 inch weapons because they're just that much more massive so that although proportionally they have the same obviously length to breadth ratio the sheer volume of the metal makes them slightly more durable and less prone to whipping around albeit that um, one or two experimental guns in that kind of caliber at long barrel lengths did have that kind of problem. David Peachy asks, regarding the use of Q-ships during World War I, and to a degree in World War II, how useful a dash successful were they? And you're right in the rest of your question, this has been covered in other dry docks before, but uh, it does deserve a little bit of a going over again. So, in World War II, they're not really around. Um... You can technically argue for that disguised merchant raiders are a form of Q-ship, but, well, they're armed merchant raiders. They uh, they have their own categorization. Generally speaking, Q-ships um, strictly are merchant ships that are armed and then disguised with the express intention of getting an enemy ship to attack them rather than using the disguise as a means to evade enemy attack. So primarily World War One, um, and in that role, I think as I've covered before, the Q ships were moderately successful. They were nowhere near as successful at actually killing the U boats as um, they were originally expected to be. But well, what they achieved can be seen as either success or failure, depending on how you want to look at it. In as much as the Germans got very nervous about Q-ships when they existed, when they learned of their existence. And this actually led to a variety of measures being taken, most of which were actually detrimental to the rest of um, merchant shipping society. So what happened is that since obviously the Q-ships were only armed with surface-mounted weaponry, um, or surface-to-surface -surface weaponry, I should say, um, they 
the U-boats basically just started going, okay, we'll just torpedo the ships. We won't surface. Um, now, this meant an abandonment of the old prize rules, so it was bad for merchant ships in as much as it meant that they were the first thing they were likely to know of a U-boat was a torpedo exploding and the ship sinking, as opposed to before where a U-boat would surface and could threaten them or otherwise persuade them into leaving the ship before it actually got shot up. Also, it took deck guns a little bit longer to send a ship to the bottom than a torpedo did. However, on the other, it did mean that the U-boats, especially in World War One, had limited stocks of torpedoes, uh, as opposed to uh, sh guns on deck, uh, shells for the guns on deck. Sorry, I should say. Um, and this meant that the number of ships a U-boat was capable of sinking if it wasn't prepared to surface and risk Q-ship attack went down dramatically. It also meant, obviously, that if the U-boats weren't running, going to run on the surface, then their overall speed was lower because their submerged speed was lower than their surface speed, which meant that their ability to catch merchant ships in the first place also went down. So Q-ship's effect in forcing the U-boats effectively to almost always attack submerged probably saved more lives than it cost but the that effect did also cost lives because of the fact that of the ships that were sunk they were almost now universally going to be sunk by torpedo rather than by being threatened with gunfire admiral tiberius asks the brooklyn st louis class had 15 six inch guns that were fitted with one of the world's first semi-automatic fire control systems how did that system work in comparison to older styles of loading and firing? How many rounds a minute could they realistically fire once the target was locked in? So the Brooklyn class's gun systems were considerably better than older style methods of firing. Um, so for a quick point of comparison, the 6-inch guns used in the Omaha class had a rate of fire, in theory, of 6 to 7 rounds a minute. And the 6-inch guns found on earlier, similar to the Omaha period, British cruisers had a rate of fire of about 6 to 7 rounds per minute. Now, in both of these cases, it should be noted that in absolute peacetime testing, though both guns could achieve something in the order of 10 to 12 rounds a minute, and in battle, more like 4 to 5 rounds a minute. So there's quite a bit of a variance between what you could achieve in peace and what you could achieve in war basically due to well a the stresses and strains of battle but also um the fact that well a battle is usually not a non-optimal condition so there's that then if you look at the more recent uh, guns that were contemporary with brooklyn's guns something like the six inch guns on the town class um, and the Leanders for that matter, they had a rate of fire of about six to eight rounds a minute. Um, so the window was a lot less between battle and ideal, um, but yeah, five to six rounds a minute was probably more realistic in battle, usually. Now, with the Brooklyn class, the the actual rate of fire, it wasn't so much... It was a, It felt like a semi-automatic weapon, but it was more along the lines of the ammunition was what they call semi-fixed. Um, I, it was two-part ammunition rather than having to load uh, separate bags of charge, which greatly increased the ability of rate of fire. So, yeah, 8 to 10 rounds a minute. Gunnery trials, I think, really reflect that 10 rounds a minute is probably a bit of an ambitious estimate, even during peacetime trials. Um, some of the records include things like 138 rounds a minute, which for 15 guns technically works out just under 10 rounds a minute. So, yeah, with the... Um, with the ammunition that they had and the guns that they had, I'd say eight to nine rounds a minute is probably realistic once you've locked in on the target, although the ships are still vulnerable to, obviously, human fatigue and human error, the same as any other guns are, because they're not fully automatic, like the uh, Worcesters or the Des Moines or uh, the Tigers. So, yeah, um, they, I'd say overall, yep, yeah, definitely worked very well. Um, you're probably looking at a locked-in rate of fire that's well in excess of almost any other uh, six inch cruiser um, just with the caveat that obviously when that is for once you're locked in on the range because if you aren't and you're just generally firing um, rounds to establish range you don't want to be firing that fast because you're going to just waste ammunition and it's going to be harder to tell what's going on.
James Wood asks, what would you do to fix the modern Royal Navy? What new vessels, how many, and what do you think priority should be to given to future research, etc.? Also, how would you think the UK shipping building industry could regain its former glory? As far as shipbuilding industry goes, the UK shipbuilding industry faces effectively the problem a lot of other shipbuilding industries um, in the Western world face of their shipbuilding industries in the first world. That means their labour costs are higher and there's a lot of labour that goes into building a ship, which means that ultimately they are always going to be outcompeted by um, shipyards that can afford to pay people less, shall we say. Um, so in the fields that a lot of British shipyards used to compete in, mass-produced civilian vessels, um, merchant vessels, etc., etc., I don't think the UK's shipbuilding industry is really ever going to regain its former glory unless, dash possibly until, um, some form of extremely high-end automation comes in, um, which almost negates the need for human labour in large part, in which case a technologically advanced country like the UK um, might be in a position to exploit that because they might have the technological base to be able to support that kind of industry, which would then allow them to churn out ships very quickly and v relatively cheaply. Um, as far as high-end stuff, well, yeah, the, that's basically where the UK shipbuilding industry rests now, is building the high-end stuff that the uh, quicker and faster and cheaper shipyards generally can't do. So... Um, warships of various kinds, especially obviously now with the Type 26 um, being sold to Australia and Canada and possibly other places, um, high-end yachts, that kind of really specialist stuff. So outside of a massive automation boom, I think the only other way the UK shipbuilding industry is going to get itself much larger would be um, to create sort of template versions of existing warship designs, kind of like what they were doing back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and trying to sell those en masse to various navies. I mean, they've sold various shipyards in the UK, have built and warships, small warships and medium-sized warships for various other countries, but generally, um, in recent years at least, the Royal Navy, the, sorry, the Brit Britain, British shipbuilding industry hasn't had much success exporting Royal Navy designs, um, albeit that that's possibly because they haven't been building that many new Royal Navy warships. The Type 42's got sold, design got sold to quite a number of countries um, back in the day when it was being built. So yes, um, I think they've got an opportunity now with the Type 26 obviously proving relatively popular. They can build and expand on that. And now that their Royal Navy's been forced into taking the Type 31 as a sort of a light frigate dash corvette, if they can come up with some kind of sort of template hull for that, where they can drop drop in other weapon systems and sensor equipment, they might have fairly good success with that, because I can see there being a lot more of a market for Type 31 style vessels as opposed to the big all-singing, all-dancing high-end frigate that is the Type 26. So yeah, d difficult, but could be done. As far as new vessels research fixing the modern Royal Navy goes, um, the Royal Navy needs more money. The defence, the UK, if the, the UK, the politicians keep going on about the military punching above its weight well yes it's forced to do that because it's constantly being starved of cash you look at the uh, um, real terms defense budget i.e accounting for inflation um, year on year and you'll see that basically outside of brief spikes relating to the gulf war or the falklands um, and basically where the government's forced it into armed conflict but outside of those spikes the overall defence budget in the UK has just been drawn down and down and down ever since World War II. Um, so the Royal Navy is expected to maintain significant parts of its commitments that it used to have when it was a full um, Imperial Navy on a very, very small budget. So first things first, they need some more money, basically. Um, what new vessels would do they need? Um, well, reinstating the programs 
that they have now that were cut back would be a good start. I mean, originally the Type 45s was supposed to be a run of 12 destroyers that have obviously been cut down and down and down. Um, originally the Type 23 frigates were supposed to be completely replaced with Type 26s. Now the Royal Navy's been told they can't have that and that if they want a like for like they're going to have to go for a mixture of Type 26s and Type 31s. Albeit that, as I say, I do think the Type 31 actually has a lot of potential, um, partly as an export ship um, and partly as a way of getting a fair degree of numbers back into the Royal Navy, which is a little bit short on hulls at the moment. So, yeah, Type 31 could be would be nice, although I'd, li I'd like to bring the Type 26s back up to one-for-one one or better replacement for the Type 23s and have the type 31s um so yeah if you've got a dozen type 45s or i guess probably by now with the march of technology you'd end up with uh half half type 45s and half type 45 pluses i guess um a nice fleet of maybe a couple of dozen type 26s and a uh, few flotillas of type 31s well already you're pushing a navy that's that's already up to maybe 50 combat hulls um which is a lot um, that would quite quite comfortably push the Royal Navy back into uh, second place as far as uh, major combatant hulls strength goes now outside of that you're probably all thinking about the big elephant in the room which is the carriers now you can make all the noises you want about the current carriers and whether they should have been catapult ships or not and whether or not having the vertical takeoff version of the F-35 is better or worse than the uh, a catapult assisted version but the simple fact is queen elizabeth and prince of wales are in the state they're in and trying to retrofit them into a more conventional aircraft carrier form just isn't going to happen now they're they're built it would cost almost as much as a new carrier to retrofit them it's just not going to happen um however um and oh and by the way we also have a couple of amphibious assault ships um since ocean has been sold off there's still albion and bulwark albeit they only seem to seem to keep one of them running at any given time but um as part of my budgetary increases i would bring both of them back up to operational status <clears throat> but anyway um if you could have it's like the, the dream royal navy where the budget has been dramatically increased and we'll get to submarines in a minute um i would probably recommend two things for the surface fleet from what we've got left of the surface fleet one of which would be that we need i think the royal navy does at that kind of budgetary level probably would need a conventional catapult type um, aircraft carrier now that would a allow one or the other of the queen elizabeth's to be used as kind of an amphibious assault command vessel thus replacing the capabilities lost with hms ocean uh, which would be nice but it would be able to have kind of a dual use so um, similar to what happened with hermes and invincible in the falklands um, if you did end up with that, another conflict of that type you would be able to utilize both Queen Elizabeths as aircraft carriers if necessary um, or reconfigure one or both of them very quickly for amphibious assault ships using the experience you had um, <coughs> gained over the years and that's not to say amphibious assault ships as in like landing Royal Marines and stuff I mean in more in terms of operating helicopters Chinooks Apaches that kind of stuff um, or just have the world's biggest anti-submarine warfare carrier I mean kind of like an inverse of what the Japanese are doing um, to be honest you probably need two catapult equipped carriers just to main so, so you don't end up in a position like the French with Charles de Gaulle of not having an operational carrier um, at any given uh, for like half the time um, although you could make an argument that the other Queen Elizabeth would provide you with that carrier force but it, again, it wouldn't be a conventional uh, takeoff, catapult assisted takeoff uh, type of ship. So your skills of the pilots, etc., would atrophy every time your your catapult ship was in dock. So I do think you'd need two. Um, I mean, come on, we're talking about ambitions here. We might as well think big. Um, the other thing that I personally would like would like to see would be some kind of cruiser brought back um probably in the 15 to 20,000 ton range 
And this isn't so much a, a Kirov style thing, it's more of a sort of almost reviving the concept of a command cruiser. Because at the moment, um, command of a Royal Navy Task Force would either have to take place on a Type 45, which really is an air defense destroyer. It, it can be a command ship, but it's not really designed to be. Um, or it has to take place on a Queen, the Queen Elizabeth class carrier if it's with the Task Force which also happens to be prime target in a wartime situation and has lots of aircraft to worry about, etc., etc. So um, possibly not the best ship to be trying to coordinate an anti-missile defence from at the same time. So yes, a, a couple of fifteen to 20,000 ton-ish uh, command cruisers with a heavy anti-aircraft battery but using the extra size and displacement to fit uh, a fully-fledged fleet command suite in and obviously a helicopter deck on the back for a bit of anti-submarine effort. That would be ideal. Um, as far as submarines go, uh, these suits are pretty good now, um, especially with their upcoming uh, midlife, well, not midlife, but f first first wave of uh, refits, etc. Um, for the earlier ones. Um, I'd just build a few more of them, to be honest. <laughs> They're, 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 they're very, very nice little subs, so I'd just do that. And anyway, that's a lot of rambling from me about the Royal Navy. I'm going to shut up now and move on to the next question. Renau Jinarin Sovereign asks a three-part question. Um, how different would the major battles of the Pacific have been if CV-6 was replaced by CVN-65, logistics aside? How would it fare being damaged by similar means as its predecessor did, i.e. hit by 500-pound bombs, kamikazes, etc.? And finally, would it have been able to turn the tide of the war by itself if, theoretically, the US decided not to churn out Essex class like a candy factory? Well, for those of you who don't quite realise the reference, this is replacing the original World War II USS Enterprise with its nuclear-powered successor. Right, well, how, how different would the battles be? Very um, you're talking about a ship that's mounting, that's carrying like Mac two capable strike fighters against zeros, um, and it's got radar, and it's got missile launchers, and it's got CRWS systems, and it can move um, hella fast TM. So the Japanese aren't going to win any battles. The 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 Enterprise at that point. It can send up a couple of its um, radar-equipped search aircraft from miles beyond the Japanese strike range. They find the Japanese fleet in about a few hours, report back, and then the next thing you know, there's laser-guided bombs and um, radar-guided missiles streaking in from left, right, and center. Before the Japanese know what's happened, everything's on fire, and it's most dishonorable. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's what would happen if you put CVN-65 in place of CV-6. Um, how would it fare if it was damaged by similar means as its predecessor? Can't, well, it's got an armoured flight deck. Um, I guess the US Navy's being very cagey with exactly how thick it is, because for the life of me I couldn't find out how how thick the armoured deck is, but just by dint of it being an armoured flight deck, it's going to withstand damage better. Um, I rather suspect, given the kind of battering it took when it actually sort of had most of its flight deck catch fire, similar to USS Forrestal, that most of the Japanese dive bombs and kamikaze, kamikaze especially, just going to bounce off rather sadly. About the only difference between that and the British care experience is that Enterprise's flight deck is so damn big, they might bounce off and bounce repeatedly across the deck like some kind of hilarious on-fire screaming skipping stone before falling over the side, or might be need to be shoved. Um, 500 pound bombs, yeah, again, bounced bounce, bounce, boom. Um, although some of the fires, if there are jet fuel equipped aircraft on board, um, possibly somewhat more spectacular. But then you're going to have to explain exactly how the heck this ship has even been hit in the first place, given that it's much more modern weapon systems, high speed, at, and the fact it's going to be miles and miles away means the Japanese very likely are never going to even find it, let alone be able to launch a successful strike. And then finally... Would it have been able to turn the tide of the war by itself if, theoretically, the US decided not to churn out Essex class? Well, given that the first part of the question said logistics aside, which would have been the single biggest problem, um, if we are ignoring logistics in terms of supplies, repairs, refits, etc., yes, of course it would. <laughs> You're talking about, well, 
The US Navy refuses to confirm or deny if nuclear weapons are ever on board its ships, and um, the Enterprise certainly existed at a time when it was capable of handling um, things like, say, the A5 with its uh, nuclear payload. So, yes, in terms of turning the tide of the war, well, you don't need to particularly worry about having a large fleet when you can nuke the few Japanese fleet concentrations that survive your conventional airstrikes out of existence, and then you can just send a vigilante or something and uh, nuke Japan early and see if they surrender at that point. So, yeah. Um, yeah, putting CVN-65 instead of CVN-6 is... I think wins the Vlad Tepes Award for Cruel and Unusual Punishment of an Enemy Who Was Already Horribly Beaten Into the Ground Anyway. Tuning3434 asks, What in your, is, in your opinion, the most effective ship or class in the era of first-generation guided missile weapon systems? And what if you take efficiency into account? Conversely, um, what gun-only ships would you consider as effective of a counterpart or do you consider their role played out after the introduction of first-generation surface-to-surface weapon systems? Um, could you elaborate on the most remarkable vessels of this first generation? Thanks in advance. Well, first-generation guided missile weapon systems, to be honest, they... Well, missile systems generally have always suffered from being way overblown in terms of actual effectiveness. Um, every time there's a conflict since World War II that involves missile weaponry, everybody prior to that has been going on and on and on about how missiles are the next generation, missiles make aircraft obsolete, missiles make piloted aircraft obsolete, missiles are going to rule the skies, blah blah blah, and every single time it turns out that actually all these PowerPoint presentation figures are a complete load of rubbish, and the missiles are far less effective than people actually think they would be. So, in terms of first generation guided missiles when they were pretty much selling the same kind of stuff that people sell these days, except with technology that's 50 to 60 years older. Um, I think actually, in terms of first generation, any ship that was entirely based on guided missile weapons was probably a horrific failure, um, if it ever come to actual full-out war. Um, so, yeah, in, in that, I would say probably the most effective class would be the Soviet missile boats, purely because, well, they're fairly uncomplicated, uh, effectively just little floating carriers for a couple of, either two to four massive, relatively slow, but incredibly powerful surface-to-surface -surface missiles. And the reason I say that it's the most effective, well, one, they did score a bunch of kills, two, um, they're fairly cheap and easy to replace. They are probably going to get blown up in large numbers, but if you're only blowing up a tiny missile boat, you don't lose all that much, and therefore you can if you afford to churn out loads and loads of them. Um, Gun-only ships... Oh, yeah, effective counterpart, yes, assuming that they've been given all the correct um, fire control system upgrades, etc. Um, Gun-only ships as effective counterpoints... If the Des Moines class, I think, probably are, are a good example of that, um, albeit that their, their key effective weapon system are, was not uh, anti-aircraft capable, so to speak. Uh, the Tiger class, for all of the fact they get quite unfairly maligned in a lot of respects, and fairly maligned in some other respects, um, probably are also worth mentioning as are the Worcesters. The main reason I mentioned the Tigers is because they had the automatic 3-inch AA guns which were actually fairly effective. I would give something like a Tiger or a Worcester a half decent chance against uh, a small swarm of Soviet surface-to-surface -surface missile boats. So yeah, uh, I don't think they were com gun only ships were completely played out in terms of surface-to-surface -surface combat in the first generation missile era. Um, their vulnerability was more to aircraft than anything else. So, yeah, um, that, that that is what I think of it. I think the, the gun-only armament of, thi of things, um, if you ignore aircraft, which obviously you wouldn't actually do, but if you're talking about in purely surface-to-surface -surface, um, terms, that 
utility probably doesn't go away and, until the advent of things like Harpoon and Exocet and that kind of widespread, um, relatively easy to to mass launch surface surface missile comes into play. Terminus Est asks. If at the Battle of Midway US carriers had not been present, then would the Japanese fleet be able to capture the island? I've heard it said Japanese forces would have had little to no chance of victory. It seems that odd to me is the amount of five how the Japanese could have brought to bear on Midway would have been immense. And two, what books would you recommend for someone who wants to know about the Japanese Navy in general from the dreadnought era to the end of World War Two? So, second part of your question first, um, if you want one single resource to try and understand the uh, at times complete hilarious madness of the Japanese Navy from the dreadnought era to the end of World War Two. Well, um, the best I could recommend would be a single book would be the one by David Evans and Mark Peaty, which is Kaigun Strategy, Tactics and Technology in the Imperial Japanese Navy 1887 to 1941. Um, Post 1941, it's like, well, that's been told a million times in a million books, but it that book is probably the single best resource uh, to try and understand the Japanese Navy across that kind of time period, and I would highly recommend it as it forms um, part of the resources for a great number of videos with, that I do when I cover the Imperial Japanese Navy, um, either directly or as part of a other Navy ship's career. As for Midway, if the American carriers aren't there, sorry, but there's no way that the um, the Americans are going to be able to hold out. Um, the Japanese will take Midway without the American carriers involved. Um, what people don't realise is, yes, you've got Wake Island in, in, and the very uh, good defence that was put up there, but look at Midway. It is tiny. It, at the time, it's mostly airfield as in literally like a significant portion of the surface area of the entirety of the Midway Atoll is an air, is a runway, <laughs> or series of runways. Um, without that, we're talking a period not that long after um, Pearl Harbor. The American fleet does not have uh, m much of a battle line left at all. Um, <clears throat> and if you exclude the carriers, then at best the Americans can throw in the land-based aircraft they've got, some cruisers and destroyers, and that's it. The Japanese then have the ability to operate their fleet carriers completely unimpeded. They have a ton of battleships um, following up. Almost their entire active battle fleet is in and around the area. Um, they've got cruisers as well, they've got destroyers as well, um, and they have their invasion force, uh, obviously, as well, in, floating around in the background. Um, for all that the Henderson Field aircraft put up a good defence during Midway itself, if they are the sum total defence defense force, apart from a few gun emplacements, and they have to contend with a good portion of the entire Imperial Japanese Navy, the best they can do is a heroic last stand and a glorious death. Um, the Japanese would take Midway, and any attempt by American um, forces to intervene without the air air support and attack power provided by the carriers that were historically present basically means that that's sending a lot of US Navy sailors to their deaths in the face of mass Japanese airstrikes. Um, and even if they get close enough to the Japanese fleet somehow by magic, well, now you've got to fight half a dozen battleships. Good luck. Um, yeah. Midway Midway is not winnable without the presence of US Navy aircraft carriers, I don't think. So Long John asks, If Operation Paravane hadn't succeeded in damaging Tirpitz, how vulnerable was Convoy JW-60 to attack from Tirpitz and the destroyers and cruisers present in Norway? It strikes me as one of the least defended Arctic convoys, having only one heavy escort, HMS Rodney, and a couple of escort carriers, it seems abysmal to say the PQ convoys that usually had a couple of King George V's and fleet carriers present. Well, the answer is surprisingly not that vulnerable. Um, although German forces in Norway in 1943 were quite powerful, by September  when JW60 sails, the situation is quite different. Um, 
Both of the surviving Deutschland class, the Lutzau and the Admiral Scheer, have been reassigned to the Baltic. Prince Eugen is also in the Baltic. Uh, Admiral Hipper has been decommissioned after the Battle of Barents Sea. And Scharnhorst, of course, was sunk at the end of 1943 by Duke of York. So there aren't actually any other German heavy units in Norway apart from Tirpitz. And it's just Tirpitz and a handful of German destroyers. Conversely, yes, the escort carriers um, may have been prevented from operating due to bad weather. Well, there is the Diadem, which is a Dido-class cruiser, um, but one of the later ones that was armed with only eight of the 5.25-inch turrets, so it's perhaps not a tremendously great combatant for this kind of scenario. But there are 12 destroyers including several that had been present for the attack on Scharnhorst. So if Tirpitz sails, and Diadem definitely will be a fairly capable combatant against the German destroyers, um, between 12 British destroyers plus Diadem, I don't think Tirpitz's accompanying destroyers, assuming they stay with it, are going to have much luck, and they're either going to be driven off or destroyed. Um, that opens Tirpitz up to continuous attacks by the destroyers using their torpedoes um, which means that Tirpitz may very well end up in a similar situation to Bismarck ironically enough for the German ships facing off against HMS Rodney um, but even if that's not the case Tirpitz is going to be faced with Rodney having had a refit yes it's wearing out but it did get a refit after the Bismarck action so it, Rodney is going to have um, radar and fire and good fire control um, Tirpitz is going to not be too bad in that department either, to be fair, but in the waters in the north, Tirpitz is going to have to, even if it's not hit by destroyer torpedoes, which personally I consider is probably possibly an unlikely scenario given how many of them there are, um, but Tirpitz is going to have to be contending with dodging incoming torpedo fire and gunfire, plus taking on Rodney, and Rodney's already demonstrated that it's more than capable of putting down a Bismarck-class battleship. So with its escort of destroyers, I would quite comfortably uh, say that if Tirpitz had come in to attack JW-60, that Rodney would probably chalk the second Bismarck-class battleship up on its kill list. Um, Dave Collier asks... I know you're not a particular fan of World's Worst Warships by Anthony Preston, however, if you were to write your own, open brackets, clearly vastly superior, close brackets, version of the book, what ships would you put in it? Well, if we're going by what the ship's capabilities actually end up being, in terms of worst warships, bearing in mind that my main focus is um, sort of mid-1800s to mid-1900s, um... In no particular order, I would have to include the Zumwalts in there somewhere, simply because the blasted things basically don't seem to have much, if anything, in the way of actual functioning weapon systems, given their sheer size. I think at the moment they're outgunned in firepower by an Arleigh Burke, which is kind of embarrassing, considering they were supposed to replace them, but never mind. Um... The Espana class, unfortunately, are going to have to go in there, um... They're, they're, they're just not very good battleships. They're, they're, they're all right for what the displacement they were given, but g given the competition they were facing, no. Um, it should come as very little surprise I'm going to stick the Nassau's in there as well. Um, the M-class submarines of the Royal Navy, definitely going to get a mention. Um, I may be cheating to include the K class as well. I think if I had to choose between the K and the M's, I would go with the M's more than the K's, um, because the K's eventually were turned into something that was not entirely useless. The M's never really got anywhere that was of any particular benefit to anybody. The first French dreadnoughts are definitely going on there. You, When you build a ship where your secondary battery outranges your main battery and it's supposed to be a dreadnought, you really, really have learned the meaning of failure. I'm not going to put the Congos in, despite the fact I like uh, ribbing on them quite a lot. Though I think a lot of the failures with the Congo class are more due to their use rather than their actual 
design and existence as ships. Yes, I think they could be a, could their redesign could have been done a lot better. Yes, I think they could have been utilized an awful lot more, but the their the almost hilarious lack of effectiveness and um losses are more down to the decisions on how to use the ships rather than the ships themselves. Uh, I'd also include the Konigsberg class cruisers, um, largely on the grounds that when you build a fleet cruiser that can't actually do the whole fleet at sea thing because it's too fragile, yeah, there are problems. HMS Captain automatic shoe in, um, and USS Galena, uh, for that matter. <laughs> um, one one ship has its armor stripped off of it because it's an ironclad where they decide the armor is actually worse than useless the other is a ship that's so terrible it rolls over and sinks at the first sign of a stiff breeze the tegethoff class particularly svent istvan would have to get an include there as biggest wasted potential given the contrast between how the ships should have performed as designed and how they actually performed once uh, the austro-hungarian shipyards had gotten through with them yeah, I think those those are the ones that immediately stand out to me. I'll probably ruminate on about a half dozen others that are floating around in the back of my head. But compared to that list, most of the others, although they're pretty bad, most of the others don't even get close to uh, to that particular collection. Jake Schultz asks, Where did your channel name come from? My channel name comes from a name that I came up with, Dash Discovered. Um, very, very obscure language um, that I know about mainly due to uh, my mixed ancestry. Um, but basically, yes, I was I was trying to work out some kind of... Oh, how long ago would this have been? Probably when I was in my teens. I was trying to work out some kind of username for various online accounts and such that wasn't taken by anybody else because I constantly ran into trying to register for things and oh this username has been taken would you like this username that is similar or this username that is the same with a random bunch of numbers stuck after it no I would not I would like to have one easy to remember username and so when I found out about this particularly rare language, I was just like, oh, this, uh, this sounds interesting. I wrote down a bunch of words um, and uh, meanings and word construction forms from the person that I was talking to um, whilst I was on holiday overseas and kept it ever since. And I was like, OK, I'm going to put together a name from it, from this. And out came Drakenfell. And... Weirdly enough, turns out very similar to a German Drac the Drakenfels Mountains or something like that, but I have no idea how that happened. Weird bit of a transcontinental confluence, but no, Drakenfell, pretty nice, pretty unique. Started registering it with everything I could get my hands on that I was particularly interested in, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Pete Agrabright asks, assuming that both were built, which do you think would have been the winner in a duel, the Montana-class battleship or whatever flavour you choose for the H-class German battleships? Well, going by the fact that the later H-class designs, as I covered in the video on that uh, particular design series, physically could not have been built in Germany, um, rather a major problem for warship existence, really, um, if we're going with the vaguely realistic H classes, even like the maximal possible H class of so maybe like H41, H42 type designs versus a Montana, I think I'm going to have to give it pretty much hands down to a Montana. The Montana is going to be carrying guns of approximately similar um, kind of firepower. Um, possibly slightly greater, depending on exactly what kind of armament the particular H-class in question is carrying. It's going to have, by the time Montana actually rolls off the stocks, it's going to have superior radar and fire control. Uh, it's going to have four extra guns, which always helps. Um, and it's going to be better protected. Um, and unlike uh, Rodney and King George V versus Bismarck, um, the Mark 8s are designed for plunging fire, which the H-Class, given that they continued to use the kind of Bismarck turpit style armour layout, is going to be fairly vulnerable to, and with the with the uh, more, more advanced radar and fire control, Montana can afford to actually bombard at medium to long range. 
I think the battle's probably going to consist of the two closing in on each other, Montana making a complete mess of the H-Class, and then possibly withdrawing back out to, say, 12, 15, 18,000 yards and just dropping some shots in um, to cause some nice big holes in rather important places like the magazines and the engine areas. Um, but yeah, I, I can't see an H-Class, a, a reasonable H-Class, I should say, um, coming out again on top against a Montana. Um, yeah, H, so something stupid like an H-44, fine, whatever, but then an H-44 is a stupid ship that could, <laughs> couldn't, as I said before, couldn't actually be built, so you might as well ask about what happens if we use a gigantic rail cannon to fire the Yamato at a Montana at, like, Mach 3. It's about the same level of plausibility. Morgan Tennant asks, I have three questions. Um, first, the round clock-like rangefinders, how do they work and how were they read? Second question, the anchor symbol on my logo, one side is straight, the other curves down, can you explain why this is? And lastly, in the opening video sequence for the 5 minute guides, there's a close up of a ship firing its guns. There's a lot of debris that looks like paper or canvas followed, following the detonation. Any idea what this stuff is? That's a very popular question in various videos. Right, so the range clocks are designed to transmit information to ships following in the battle line as to what range the ship ahead is engaging at. Um, this is quite useful, obviously, in an era where one ship might find a firing solution and all of a sudden everyone else needs to know roughly what range the enemy is at if they've guessed badly. So, as you can see here, there's a couple of varieties of the clock. Now, this is designed, as I say, to tell you the range in three steps. So firstly, you would consult the little dot that is moving around the edge of the clock face. This registers thousand, uh, ten thousands of yards. So if the, dial, if the dot is pointed at zero, then the range is somewhere between zero and ten thousand yards. If it's pointed at one, it's ten to twenty thousand yards. And if it's pointed at two, it's twenty to thirty thousand yards. Next, you look at the hour hand, and the hour hand will tell you in steps of one thousand yards um, what the next uh, range marker is, so between zero and uh, nine. And then the minute hand, the long hand, tells you the range in 100 yard steps. So if we look at the clocks as shown here on the top left and the top right, the display there you see the dot is pointed to one. So that tells us that we're adding 10,000 yards as our first amount. And then we look at the hour hand. The hour hand is pointing to eight. So that's 18,000 yards because it's 10,000 plus 8,000, and the minute hand is pointing at 3, so that is 18,300 yards. And so that's that telling us exactly what range the ship is firing at. Now you'll notice that these dials also have an accompanying one that is looks a bit more like a normal clock with uh, no dot going around the outside and runs from 1 to 12. And these hands are used to indicate numbers that correspond to numerical code, which in turn corresponds to spotting information. So there would be a set series of spotting reports codified by various numbers and uh, the more conventional clock hand would tell you that. So, for example, the one on the left is telling you to look at um, 2, 4. So you'd look in your book and you'd say, OK, well, what is spotting in, uh, item 2, 4? Oh, it's that. OK, right, we know what, what he's talking about. Now, the anchor, and very well, well, congratulations for spotting it. This is an Admiralty pattern anchor. Uh, it has a stock on the top. Well, you could call it a cross piece, I guess. Um, the reason one side curves down is this is trying to be a representation of an anchor where actually the stock and the anchor flukes are at 90 degrees to each other. The bend on the one side is in order for the anchor to be able to be laid on its side and then it will rest on that bent side. So if you search Admiralty pattern anchor, um, you'll see what I mean. The, the kind of anchors that are just stuck up on display of that type. Um, you'll see there's one in one of the stocks is bent over to allow the anchor to just rest on that rather than rolling all over the place. And as for the mysterious rush of material, um, here's a still from that little clip, and you might be able to work out fairly easily these are British battleships firing. Um, now, if you play it through by frame by frame, what you actually notice is just off to the left, you can see there's kind of almost like a box uh, closer to the camera that's covered with 
um, some cloth. Now if you play it through frame by frame what you'll notice is actually the shockwave from the guns firing makes that cloth go flying all over the place and most of the source of the various bits of flying debris seems to come from actually off screen to the left of that. Um, so I don't think it's actually from the gun turrets itself. I think probably somebody has improperly stowed something um, near the aft of the ship and the shockwave um, from the guns firing basically has shredded that and sucked it all into view of the camera. Paul from Chicago asks, what was the Baltic project? Could it have succeeded if Churchill had been talked out of Gallipoli? So the Baltic project was an attempt, well, proposal by Lord Fisher to break the deadlock of the Western Front by utilising the Royal Navy's uh, superiority at sea. The idea was to get a bunch of Allied troops, possibly British, possibly Russian, um, and sail a large invasion force into the Baltic to land on the coast of Pomerania, not a million miles away from Berlin, and basically launch a lightning-fast attack on Berlin itself, which in theory um, would knock them out of the war. I guess they were playing with um, capital conquest mode enabled. Now, to do that, they obviously thought they were going to need lots of um, monitors and support craft. This is where courageous glorious and furious came from um, they were designed originally for this project as shallow draft high speed support ships uh, to support the landings the idea apparently ran to let's use lots and lots of submarines and mines to keep the high seas fleet out because the they did at least recognize that there was no way they were going to get the grand fleet to go down um, through the narrow straits between denmark and sweden at all safely so, and the Baltic as it's very shallow in places so the idea was to use a combination of the Grand Fleet menacing the Germans and submarines and mines to try and keep the high seas fleet away from the invasion force long enough for them to drop all the troops off and then presumably skedaddle um, would it have worked I have no idea um, I'm going to lean probably towards not um, I think faced with the um, choice of there's a bunch of allied troops bearing down on possibly your capital city i don't think the germans would have minded running the high seas fleet and its screen through a bunch of mines and submarines um, in an effort to stop that whether or not those troops would have accomplished all that much whether they would have taken berlin etc that's a whole other matter entirely but whether or not the fleet would even have got there in the first place without suffering significant losses is not something that i think was particularly likely unless somehow the British managed to lure the German high seas fleet out into some kind of decisive battle at the same time. Bryce MacDonald asks, listening to prior dry dock questions about anti-aircraft artillery, you seem to indicate that shorter calibre guns are better than longer calibre. Is this true and why? So it depends greatly on the type of gun you're talking about. When I'm making reference to those kind of things, I'm talking mostly about what we would otherwise classify as dual-purpose guns on battle, uh, secondary guns on battleships, or primary guns on destroyers. Now, in that case, yes, I would make the argument that it, for the World War II period, certainly slightly shorter caliber guns are better than longer caliber. That's not because of the intrinsic properties of the gun itself. As a few people have pointed out in, in various comments on the videos, um, very effective anti-aircraft guns like the German 88mm flat gun are actually quite long barrel. Um, and yes, they are. There's no denying that. Um, However, the 88mm is, believe it or not, a relatively small gun in the realm of naval warfare. And you're talking about 105, 120, anything up to 150 millimeter by the end of the war as your kind of dual purpose AA or in the lower aspect of that primary and armament for destroyers. Now, when it comes to those particular um, standards of gun, the shorter calibre, I believe, is better, and the reason for that is, as I say, it's not to do with the gun barrel itself, because a longer barrel gives you higher velocity, which means you can reach further and faster, which then increases your effectiveness against aircraft. The main reasons are to do with recoil. Obviously, a longer gun um, 
generally they also tend to have a slightly larger charge and they're accelerating the shell to a higher velocity which then means there is more recoil um, and that means that you have to deal with the problem that your mounting has to be a lot bigger and a lot heavier to deal with that recoil um, your recoil path is going to be longer which ex it means the size of the mount gets even larger um, and that also means that at higher elevations you need to mount your gun significantly further off the deck because you don't want the breech of your gun smashing down into your deck or you have to make a pit for the gun to go down into um, the, and so you end up with the gun itself physically weighing more because it's a bigger gun in terms of length and you end up with a mounting that's also a lot bigger and heavier that all means it's much harder for you to turn and elevate that gun you need more energy to do so um, which means that generally speaking for the same level of technology the training and turning rate of your gun is going to be slower uh, because of the distance travelled by the recoil the energy involved it also likely means that the return to its um, rest position in terms of of linear movement so that you can reload it is also likely to take slightly longer so your rate of fire will be slightly slower all told therefore that means that a slightly shorter caliber gun which therefore needs a lower profile lighter weight and faster uh, mounting or turret is likely to provide you with significantly greater rate of fire and ability to track incoming aircraft as opposed to a long barrel um, anti-aircraft weapon and the these issues become exacerbated when you go up to this kind of size because of again the square cube law um, so an 88 yes you can have a very a nice long barrel 88 and the machinery of the period is capable of keeping up with that but if you um, increase that caliber by say 50 percent you're ending up with a 125 or 127 millimeter gun um, the length of the gun might have only gone up by 50%, but the volume of the gun, i.e. The, and uh, therefore the mass, has gone up considerably more. Um, so, the, yeah, specifically for the World War II period, um, I believe that the slightly shorter guns are actually more practical for the kind of anti-aircraft work they're expected to do. And so this is why I think guns like the 4.5 inch 45 for the British and the 5 inch 38 for the Americans and similar related guns in the Axis navies are the better um, sort of heavy caliber anti-aircraft guns of the war. Now a lot of those issues and restrictions go away when machinery improves and, and uh, you can therefore turn and aim heavier guns faster and that's why in the later part of the second world war and technically going into the post-war period um, you have things like the um, well the 5.25 inch 50 caliber on the british for the british starts to actually function as a useful weapon um, before the first mountings weren't particularly brilliant um, you also have the um, six inch 50 which is developed for um, the tiger class cruiser and of course you also have the six inch 47 on the worcester class so let's say when some machinery catches up then you could go back to using your longer barrel higher velocity guns so it's pretty much a situational thing for world war ii Mason Asher Stewart asks, how come the Battle of the Barents Sea was and still is considered such a fiasco? Yes, the attack was abortive and accomplished nothing, but it wasn't exactly a costly disaster e either. Was it really something the commander of the Kriegsmarine needed to resign over? Much worse had happened earlier in the war. So the Battle of the Barents Sea is more seen as a failure due to the sheer comedic ineptitude of the whole engagement. Um, if you look at things on paper, you'd think that everything was possibly relatively easily matched, um, in that there are six destroyers on each side, um, and then you'd say, oh, uh, maybe um, the... The, the Germans have some advantage in that they've got two heavy cruisers versus two light cruisers. However, once you look break down the action itself, and this is where it really gets silly, is the fact that the two British light cruisers only showed up about three hours into the engagement, um, since they were off guarding another part of the convoy, and 
um, the six destroyers were likewise scattered around the convoy, whereas the German forces, in theory, should have been uh, grouped a lot closer together. So you had a theoretical engagement of two heavy cruisers, including a Deutschland class with 11-inch guns, plus six destroyers, versus, for most of the time, two or three destroyers. Um, which should and the occasional uh, minesweeper, um, which should have given the Germans a hilariously overwhelming advantage. However, it seems that the Kriegsmarine units there seem determined to just stuff it up every single time. Um, they fell for the Royal Navy destroyers executing dummy torpedo attacks. Um, they completely missed the approach of the light cruisers, which ended up with Admiral Hipper getting shot up. Um, when Admiral Hipper finally realised, oh yes, I'm being shot at by a pair of town glass light cruisers, um, the immediate response was to run away. Um, when Lutzau engaged the convoy completely unopposed, it hit nothing, um, wandered over to where Hipper was being shot at and then decided, screw this, I'm off home. Um, a couple of German destroyers decided that a town class cruiser looked completely like an Admiral Hipper class cruiser, tried to fall into formation with a Sheffield, and one of them got blown apart for its troubles. Um, and so, yeah, basically the Germans had near enough the perfect opportunity in that they had sort of, by whole numbers, a three to four to one advantage um, against the immediate Royal Navy ships they were engaging for most of the duration. They had a firepower advantage, even if you added the entirety of the escorts together and put them in, in one straight-line battle. Their heaviest unit had managed to have quite a while shooting completely unopposed at the convoy without anyone particularly trying to stop them. And they accomplished nothing in terms of damaging the convoy and got their own ships shot up and lost a destroyer for what exactly um it, it basically it's an it's an uncontested complete and utter failure of command and coordination on the germans part which is actually relatively unlike the kriegsmarine um and this caused hitler to just go well look if we if 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 we can't even win in circumstances where we have a superiority how the heck is any of this worth anything and then he tried to scrap the service fleet um so yeah that, that is in a nutshell why baron c is seen as such a hilariously um ridiculous failure matt blom asks in your opinion what 20th century naval battle is most interesting but receives little historical coverage well i'm going to put forward two general not category, but series of engagement nominations. Um, possibly three, see how it goes. So for the more classic era, I would actually say there's there's a whole collection of small cruiser and destroyer actions fought between the US Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy um, in and around the various islands of the Pacific. And most of the time, people ignore them. Um, a lot of the time people have never heard of them. I mean, most, most people have heard of things like Guadalcanal and Savo Island, but um, there's a lot of other engagements in that period which are, they, they actually showcase the different qualities of the two navies and the changing advantages and disadvantages of the two as time progresses. And virtually nobody's heard of them. Um, so, yeah, that that, that lot. Um, also, the engagements between the uh, Indian and Pakistani navies in the Indo-Pakistan War, um, they're quite interesting in that they are examples of relatively full-on naval conflict in the sort of first-second generation missile era. Um, so they actually give to a certain degree, something of an insight as to how some of the, some of the theoretical naval conflicts of the Cold War might have played out in that kind of time period. But again, virtually no one's ever heard of them. And I think if we're going to put a third one in, the, a battle that doesn't get that much attention but probably had impacts all out of proportion to its immediate effects was the first Battle of Heligoland Bight. I mean, the second Battle of Heligoland Bight is quite interesting in and of itself, but the first battle particularly, um, it's a very much an escalating engagement between the Royal Navy and the, uh, the Germans 
right at the start of the First World War. Um, it ends very badly for the Germans, but the outcome of it, it's like the, the losses to the Germans don't particularly hamper the high seas fleet overall effectiveness, even though they do lose three light cruisers and a bunch more are damaged, um, amongst other things. But one of the single biggest impacts of it um, comes from the fact that the German government and the Kaiser in particular um, get very scared by the fact that very early into the war their their fleet seems to have been thoroughly trounced by the British, even though um, the British did quite hilariously outnumber them by the end. Um, and they restrict the action of the High Seas Fleet, which sets a pattern for the first couple of years of the war that leads directly to eventually um, things trying to escalate with the various raids and therefore and thus on to Jutland. So um, yeah, First Battle of Heligan and Land Bite sets the course of the naval war in the First World War for pretty much the first half of the conflict, which um, is a pretty major impact that most people have never even heard of the engagement. Mackensen asks, did Germany have any plans for an aircraft carrier during World War One? Not, as far as I can determine, an aircraft carrier in the way that we think of them now, as in sort of flight deck, etc. They did build, um, well, converted uh, five seaplane carriers from merchant ships, and they eventually ended up also converting one of their smaller cruisers to a seaplane carrier, and they had plans to convert a much larger armoured cruiser to a seaplane carrier that didn't come to anything as a result of the end of the war. Um, so they were definitely building aircraft carrying vessels, uh, much of the same as uh, the British were building in things like uh, Ben Mishri and uh, the First Ark Royal. Uh, well, the First Ark Royal as a carrier, I should say. There were Ark Royals before that. Um, so yeah, they, ha they had plans and executed plans for seaplane carriers, but as far as I can tell, no, not for the kind of uh, flight deck aircraft carrier that we think of today. Lewis Maskell asks, It's said that Jellicoe was the only man who could have lost the war in an afternoon. Which British Admiral in World War II do you think had the closest level of responsibility and why? So I thought about this quite a bit. And, I mean, some of the obvious answers you think, oh, well, Admiral Tovey in the home fleet um, having to guard the northern waters around Britain from German excursions. Yes, okay, fine. Important. Um but not necessarily going to lose the war in an afternoon if he gets something horribly wrong. Um, for that particular role, I would say I actually I couldn't decide between three particular people, so I'm going to name them all and let people see what they think. First up, Admiral Ramsey. Um, he's the one who orchestrated the Dunkirk evacuation. And I think that is very much a case of if he'd messed that up and Britain had not only lost all its heavy equipment, but the vast bulk of its trained soldiers, both that actual loss in terms of military effect and in terms of morale, that could have been devastating to Britain's war effort very early on at a period when the war was not going well. Now, once you go past that, I'd say my next candidate is going to be Admiral Somerville, um, now, he had many, many roles during the Second World War, but he's kind of possibly could have lost the war in an afternoon position. Um, probably came during the, his time in command of Force H, uh, he, holding the gates of Gibraltar open, um, as he had to organise, escort and protect a bunch of convoys um, into the Mediterranean, particularly some of the, some of the Malta convoys. Um, he also, uh, as commander of Force H, led the um, renowned Ark Royal and Sheffield out to hunt down the Bismarck, um, and he faced off against the Italian fleet more than once. So individually, any one of those actions, I guess you could probably say, may not have lost the war, but if he'd screwed up any one of those major actions, it could have dramatically changed the course of the war, and not for the better. Um, so collectively, I think that period of uh, his command was probably the most critical to the British war effort, even if you could probably make an argument that maybe loss of any individual one of those actions may not have completely wrecked the war for the UK.
And the other one I have to name is Admiral Cunningham. Admiral Cunningham spent the vast bulk of the war in command of the Mediterranean fleet. Um, he was the one who, along with Admiral Somerville helping, um, basically had to deal with the consequences of the German invasion of Greece, their subsequent invasion of Crete, uh, the various back and forths of the naval of the uh, ground war, shall I say, in North Africa, with um, first the Italians and then later Rommel, um, all the supplies going back and forth to that theatre, um, holding up his end of the bargain as far as trying to keep Malta and the other uh, areas supplied went and having to deal with the Italian fleet, which was forever obviously trying to cut off um, Allied supply lines and enhance their own. If he had messed up really badly at some point, then again, that could have had massively major consequences um, for the British war effort. Um, now, you might think, oh, well, it's a desert war in North Africa, what does it really matter? Well, the fact of the matter is, if if the British lose in the desert they then lose the Suez Canal which means they lose a vital communication and transportation link um, from Europe well the European theater to um, the Far East there's a lot of trade that goes out along along there it's also pretty much the, the gateway to the oil fields if they fold and lose then um, Rommel basically can run unchecked into the Mesopotamian oil fields, which solves a lot of Germany's oil problems and potentially long term allows them, if they can manage to find the forces for it, uh, to open yet another front against the beleaguered Russians, which isn't going to help things, as, was, as well as cutting Britain off from the oil and all the other supplies and such like that were coming up, um, up and around from that area. So, yeah. Admiral Cunningham, if he had lo taken a major a offensive action against the Italian Navy, as he did a couple of times, and he'd screwed that up, and the Mediterranean fleet had either been destroyed or incapacitated and, and locked up, and then the Germans and the Italians had been able to supply their forces at will in North Africa, and the British had been then unable to do the same, that could have thrown Britain completely for a loop, almost as bad, if not worse, as the loss of its troops at Dunkirk. So, yeah, uh, I think he definitely deserves some credit as well in that department. Gabriel A. Hawkins asks a very long and complicated question that basically asks, how does radar, when radar is being used to provide fire control data for the guns, manage to track and distinguish the radar splashes of the guns it's directing from that of any other ship during mass engagements such as uh, say the battle of Surigao Strait when there are loads of American ships with radar opening up on one poor lonely Japanese battleship so it's a bit of a fudge really it's a bit of a combination of a number of factors later on um, radar could actually track the shells themselves which was always useful um, but outside of that, it was a combination of using the radar and also using the effectively book learning that, and in some cases, literal books they had on hand um, to work everything out. So how it would work would be, obviously, in, te in peacetime, they would have worked out if we fire this gun at this range, the shells will take this time to uh, land and that will be the flight time of the shell. Great. So when you're using um, radar in this kind of environment, you have your range, so you know approximately where your shells are going to land. You, which obviously in this case is going to be Yamashiro. Um, you then have elevated your guns, you've fired your shells, you know when you fired your shells, and you therefore, in theory, know how long those shells are going to take to arrive at the target so you can kind of go right well i've let's say the flight time is 30 seconds so i've fired my shells at 2 30 exactly in the morning so i'm looking at my radar screen for shell splashes i'm going to be looking for shell splashes that occur 30 seconds later if i see a shell splash 15 seconds later or 20 seconds later or 35 seconds later I'm going to be pretty sure they aren't mine. 
so as long as you've got a decent stopwatch, you can narrow your window of when you actually have to look for shell splashes to a pretty tight um, margin, and that will help you distinguish um, where who whose shell splashes are whose. The other thing that you can use, assuming that you can't track your own shells, is your pattern of firing. So if you notice, for example, that the ship down the row is firing a full broadside, you might fire two staggered half broadsides in quick succession. So if it looks like you've both fired simultaneously, you're, you won't look for a massive set of eight shell splashes at the same time. You're going to look, look for two sets of four, one after the other. Um, and especially with the standards with four turrets, you can come up with all sorts of weird and wonderful variations on that, whether you want to ripple fire all the way down, you want to do two and two, you want to do four and aft, and then another two for four and aft, or whatever. There's all sorts of various combinations you can do. So, yeah, it's basically about knowing your flight time and making your pattern distinguishable enough for your officers. Christopher Dent asks, Is there any truth to the story that the US was prepared to loan USS Iwo Jima to the Royal Navy had they lost Invincible or Hermes in the Falklands, and how effective would Iwo Jima have been as a Royal Navy fleet unit? There, well, at least until documents are fully declassified, does seem to be a fair degree of truth to that concept. I mean, reports floated around for years afterwards that the US Navy was prepared to loan the UK a carrier, quote-unquote. Um, it's only in more recent years that officials at the time have revealed that particularly this was supposed to have been the Iwo Jima, as opposed to what everyone else thought by US Navy lending everyone a carrier, which would have been a Nimitz class, probably. Um, maybe one of the conventional ones, who knows. Um, but no, so it, it does appear that Iwo Jima was the one that had been earmarked. Now, as far as effectiveness goes, Iwo Jima would have been smaller and less capable, there's no doubt about it. Um, it's, it's considerably smaller than HMS Hermes, um, it's even smaller than HMS Invincible, um, and it doesn't have a ski ramp either. Now, in terms of its combat effectiveness, it's also an amphibious assault ship, it's not a dedicated carrier, so it's not going to be able to operate quite as many aircraft at quite the same operational tempo. Um, the biggest, the two biggest problems that it's going to face, apart from its lack of size and therefore, as we said, not able to operate quite as effectively, is the fact that if Invincible and or Hermes have gone down, that's probably going to take a bunch of the British Sea Harriers with them. And the American AV-8 and AV-8B Harriers that the US Marine Corps would have left conveniently on board... Um, are not anywhere near as um, set up for air-to-air -air combat as the Sea Harriers were. Um, so if a significant portion of the Sea Harrier force had gone down, that could quite severely compromise the ability of the Royal Navy, even with the Ochima, to maintain air superiority over the Falklands um, as compared to um, if they kept them. Although, obviously, it does depend at what stage in the campaign this occurs. Um, and without the ski ramp, obviously the planes can't take the Harriers can't take off with as heavy a war load either. So in in terms of that effectiveness, I don't think it would have been great as a one for one replacement. It certainly wouldn't have been a one for one replacement. It I think if if one if maybe Invincible had gone down, considering that Hermes being bigger had um, more operational capability, if Invincible had gone down and you're talking about maybe at least a third of the way into the conflict, and it had managed to get the majority of its Harrier complement up and away before going down, um, or maybe just crippled and knocked out of action, then Iwo Jima might, have, might well have um, formed a useful um, plug, because Hermes could have maybe decamped its um, Harrier GR3s to join with the uh, Marine AV-8s, to effectively treat Ojima as the air support ship for the landings, with Hermes taking over the role of Sea Harrier operations entirely. Um, if it was the other way around and Invincible was having to run all Sea Harrier operations, maybe maybe not quite so much, considering its smaller size. Um, so yeah, it, it potentially could have kept the Royal Navy going, 
but as I say it depends when it's lost, which Royal Navy ship is lost, and exactly what goes down with it. I wouldn't necessarily say straight up that it would have been completely effective um, in terms of being able to allow the Royal Navy to uh, win the Falklands War. Um, would have been very interesting if someone had shown had uh, quietly shown up with uh, either a conventional or nuclear powered supercarrier, though that would have been hilarious. And finally, Brad asks, with the discussion of the better quality armour of German and British ships, uh, steel quality that is, how, in World War II, how reticent were both groups to share these secrets with their ship-building allies? Uh, fairly reticent is the answer to that, um, partly because the companies that are actually manufacturing the armour plate were still, to a great degree, private entities, so this was their closely guarded commercial secrets, they were not going to let those go easily at all so um yeah the, the, it wouldn't necessarily even have mattered too much if the governments did want to share it they would have had to then persuade the um actual manufacturers themselves to share industrial secrets and that would have involved a lot of compensation etc um so yeah i don't think they were particularly keen to share and also Whilst we can look back now and say, yeah, okay, we can see how all the Allies match up. Well, one, there is the fact that Italy had changed sides in World War One, and they would go on to change sides again in World War Two. So the Italian, the Germans were not 100% trusting of the Italians, um, shall we say. And to be fair, the Italian tourney armour was not too bad either. It was pretty, pretty decent quality stuff. Um... Eventually, the Ger Germans were trading trade se secrets with the Japanese, um, but no idea if they traded armor secrets eventually. And as far as the US and the UK were concerned, although they were natural allies to a certain degree, I mean, the fact that the US didn't jump into the war in 1939 shows you they're not quite as closely bonded as uh, you might think, given um, post-war propaganda. And so between that and the fact that the US Navy and the Royal Navy were the two biggest navies on the planet and therefore had a certain degree of rivalry going, and tensions were not entirely diminished from the 1920s, Britain wasn't about to give any secrets of superior armour tech to the Americans if it, they could at all help it. Um, because, as I say, everyone had a rough idea of who would side with who if there was another big war, but one, they were hoping there wouldn't be another big war, and two, they weren't necessarily quite sure that that's how it would all turn out. And with that, we bring this Patreon edition of The Dry Dock to a close. I need a drink. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, hope you uh, have even more questions in the Q&A to keep this whole thing going. And I'm off to play one of my favourite games ever. Because guess what? I recently found out, a little bit late to the party, that Imperium Galactica 2 has a uh, HD texture remake on Steam. So I'm a very happy person, and I will go off and be the Solarian Federation and design many battleships to shoot many alien races with. Uh, and on that slightly non-naval-related note, thank you very much, and see you ne next time.